Today we're going to be considering questions about disability. Specifically, I'm going to ask the question, what is disability in a general sense? And then we're going to ask questions about how disability is related to personal well-being and flourishing. To tie back in with previous classes, we're in the process of moving from genetic screening and gene editing to questions about disability. So with genetic screening, we looked at Savulescu. Savulescu was encouraging people to use genetic screening to check for and eliminate things like predisposition to blindness, predisposition to deafness, any sort of trait that might be associated with something we call disability. So Savulescu is saying we need to use genetic screening to make sure that future offspring don't have disabilities. Savulescu even went as far as to argue that it is bad that blind and deaf children are born when sighted and hearing children could have been born in their place. Now in the last video, I looked into questions about whether or not this is discriminatory. Uh, not only that, but whether or not Savulescu's argument is hurtful and damaging to people with disabilities. In between videos, we also looked at an infamous case called the death of baby Doe. The link is provided in the description below. So this actually occurred, this was in Indiana in 1982. An infant was born with Down syndrome. The infant needed routine, low-risk surgery to correct a defect in his esophagus. So without this surgery, the infant was going to die. Again, it was a routine surgery. There's no real risk, it's very successful, and the infant needs it to survive. In this case, the parents actually opted to do nothing and just let the infant die. This was actually done under the guidance of the mother's obstetrician, a physician by the name of Walter Owens. In looking at interviews with everyone who was involved, it seems very clear that Baby Doe was allowed to die simply because he was suspected of having Down syndrome. In other words, had the infant been born with the same esophageal problem, which again is very easy to correct, had they been born with the same esophageal problem but not suspected of having Down syndrome, it's very clear based on the interviews and the process involved that the physician, Dr. Owens, would have taken a very different stance and would have opted for surgery. So specifically because the infant had Down syndrome, this is why the physician, this is why the parents allowed the infant to die. Owens, for example, argued that infants with Down syndrome can't be expected to have a very high quality of life. And he even made the claim that, I believe there are things that are worse than having a child die, and one of them is that it might live. In other words, he's saying that because Baby Doe has Down syndrome, it might actually be worse if Baby Doe survives than if Baby Doe just dies now. This raises tons of questions about discrimination, about whether or not an infant should receive medical treatment based on quality of life or expected quality of life. But one thing to keep in mind with Dr. Owens and with Savulescu is that both of them seem to be operating from the assumption that they're doing what's best for the affected individual. So Savulescu is saying we need to screen for conditions that lead to blindness or deafness because those conditions diminish an individual's flourishing or well-being or happiness. Savulescu thinks that because these conditions take away from a person's well-being that we should make sure our kids don't have those conditions. Similarly, Dr. Owens is arguing that this particular infant shouldn't be kept alive because its life is going to be a miserable one. Again, Savulescu and Owens both seem to think that they're operating in the best interest of the affected individuals. But this leads us to the question of whether or not things like Down syndrome inherently take away from the well-being of a person's life, or things like blindness or deafness. Does this make your life less good? Or do disabilities of certain kinds make life not worth living? Are they so bad that life just isn't worth living with them? For that reason then, we're going to consider two questions today. These two questions are, what is disability? So in a general sense, what even is disability? Can we come up with an account of it? And the second question, how does disability affect an individual's well-being, if at all? So we're not going to take for granted the assumption that disability, whatever that is, takes away from a person's happiness or makes their life bad in any way. We're not going to assume that at the beginning. Rather, what I want to do is look at different answers to these questions. So questions about what is disability, we'll look at different accounts. Questions about what's the relation between disability and well-being, we'll look at different answers to that as well. Just to start then, 
the question, what is disability in a general broad sense? To answer this question, we might start by looking at some examples, traits or features that we think that for sure is a particular disability. Wasserman and co-authors, for example, list the following, loss of limb, loss of sensory functions such as blindness or deafness, progressive neurological conditions such as multiple sclerosis, chronic diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, the inability or limited ability to perform certain cognitive functions such as remembering faces or calculating sums, and psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. All of these different traits or features or conditions, whatever you want to call them, sometimes get included in the class of things called disability. That means that disability includes physical features, mental features, emotional features. It includes a whole lot of stuff that doesn't seem to be related, at the surface at least. The question then is, can we come up with some sort of general account of disability that explains why all of these different features, conditions, traits are included in one group together? What is it that these things have in common? At the start, this might be an impossible project. It might be that all of these different traits or conditions or features don't actually have any one thing in common. So to group them together doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Here's what Wasserman and co-authors say. There seems to be little about the functional or experiential states of people with various conditions to justify a common concept. In other words, the way that disability affects your functioning or the way that disability is experienced, that comes in so many different variations that it may not actually make sense to group these things together as though they're one sort of thing. If that's right, then the common concept of disability may not actually exist. There is no sort of common concept to all of these things. We just lump them all together in a group for whatever reason. Elizabeth Barnes makes a similar claim. She says, there is no good answer to the question that explains the commonality solely in terms of what disabled bodies are like. There's nothing about what disabled bodies are like that by itself unifies or explains the category of disability. Disability is not a natural kind, and it cannot be explained via objective features of disabled bodies. If Barnes is right, if Wasserman and co-authors are right, then it seems like the word disability is just a catch-all term. It covers a whole lot of unrelated things that we've just grouped together artificially. On the other hand, there are lots of proposals for the common link between all these different traits or conditions that we call disabilities. One option is this. Disability is a departure from normal functioning or from species norm. So for example, normally functioning human beings can hear. They have the capacity to hear things. That means if one particular human being lacks that feature and is not able to hear, that's a kind of deviation from the species norm. They're functioning in a way that's not normal given the species or given the type of thing that they are. So on this view, disability is just a kind of deviation from whatever normal functioning is. A problem with this definition is that it's almost certainly going to include far too many things. Usain Bolt, for example, functions in a very abnormal way when you look at the species norm. So the species norm, human beings can run a particular speed on average, but Usain Bolt can far exceed that. So his function with respect to how fast he can run is not normal. It's a serious deviation from the species norm. Based on the first definition then, it sounds like the implication is Usain Bolt is disabled, but that's obviously false. So the first definition is going to need some kind of improvement or qualification. One suggestion for improving the first definition is to say that disability is a negative departure from normal functioning or species norm. So now we've built in some sort of value-laden term. We're saying that disabilities are not a mere deviation, but a bad deviation from whatever normal is. This is probably going to include too many things as well. Having mutations on the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, for example, will dispose an individual to developing certain kinds of breast cancer. These types of mutations are uncommon in that it's not normal to have these types of mutations, and it does seem like a bad thing. So here we have a negative deviation from the species norm, but people with these types of mutations 
aren't usually classified as disabled. The mutation is a kind of negative departure from the species norm, but that's not enough to make these individuals disabled. So again, it seems like the second definition, like the first, is going to include too many things. And the question is, can we continue to refine the definition of disability so that it captures all the right things, doesn't include too much, and doesn't exclude too much? In the literature, there are tons of proposals about how to do this. For the sake of time, I'm just going to move on to our second question for today, but I'll give you some sources at the end that you can look into if you want to read more about potential definitions or proposed definitions for disability. What I want you to take away up to this point in the video is that the term disability might actually be pretty tough to define in a way that captures all the things we typically count as disability, but excludes features or traits that we think are not disabilities. In other words, defining the term disability might actually be a tough thing to do. Still, even if we don't have a general account of disability, we can still ask questions about how particular disabilities, like blindness, deafness, and so on, how do those affect a person's well-being or flourishing or happiness? So this leads us to our second question, namely, what is the relationship between disability and an individual's well-being? We can ask the question too, is having a disability directly and automatically a negative thing for one's well-being? That is, is it the case that just having a disability means you're less likely to flourish or less likely to lead a happy life? According to Savalescu, it sounds like the answer is yes. He thinks that having a disability directly takes away from the individual's ability to have a good, fulfilling, flourishing life. Dr. Owens seemed to think the same sort of thing in the Baby Doe case, but not everybody is gonna agree with this. And there might actually be really good evidence to the contrary. There might be really good evidence that suggests people with disability often lead very happy lives and flourish just as much as people without disability. So in looking at answers for this question, I'm going to talk about two different models of disability. The first is the medical model of disability, and the second is a social model of disability. Both of these models of disability are going to help us think about how an individual's well-being or flourishing relates to their having a disability. Let's start with the medical model. As Olkin puts it, according to the medical model, disability is seen as a medical problem that resides in the individual. It is a defect in or failure of a bodily system and as such is inherently abnormal and pathological. The goals of intervention are cure, amelioration of the physical condition to the greatest extent possible and rehabilitation, that is, the adjustment of the person with the disability to the condition and to the environment. Persons with disabilities are expected to avail themselves of the variety of services offered to them and to spend time in the role of patient or learner being helped by trained professionals. There's a lot to unpack there. So disability is a problem. It's something to be corrected, something to be fixed, something to be improved upon. It's pathological. It's a negative departure from species function. It's a bad thing. Even further, as Wasserman and co-authors put it, on this kind of view, on the medical model, disability necessarily reduces well-being. Even in a utopian world of non-discrimination, people with blindness, deafness, or paraplegia would be worse off than their able-bodied counterparts. In other words, the badness of disability on the medical model is explained in terms of physiological terms that are independent of social structures. That means in the perfect world where nobody discriminates against anybody, people who are blind are still not going to flourish as much as people who are not blind, all else being equal. So on the medical model, disability is a negative, it's inherent to the individual. That is, it's a bad thing no matter how society is set up, no matter whether there's discrimination or not, it's inherently bad. Not only is disability thought of as inherently bad on this model, but it's something to be corrected or fixed with medical intervention if possible. So as Olkin had pointed out, people with disabilities are expected to kind of go to the medical professional to seek help and, for lack of a better way of putting it, have their disability corrected or fixed. You need to ask the question though, why think that conditions like blindness, deafness, or paraplegia, why think that these are inherently bad? What is it that makes them bad? And one thing we need to look at is who is saying that? Is it the case that people who think that disabilities are bad are non-disabled persons? 
So for example, if somebody who's not blind thinks really hard about what being blind would be like and then says, oh, that must be awful, is that someone we should be listening to or should we just be talking to people who actually live with the relevant disabilities? One reason to think that people who don't have disabilities are not really good judges here is that there's something that Elizabeth Barnes calls transition costs. As somebody who can see, you might think about what the world would be like if you were to lose your vision. And that would be an extremely traumatic event, that would be a really hard adjustment, that would be full of all sorts of pain and frustration, but that has to do with the fact that you had vision and then lost it. So there's a transition cost. Transitioning from non-blind to blind carries with it all sorts of negative experiences. Transition costs don't apply to people who are born with disabilities. So it's not the case that they've gone from being non-disabled to disabled. And that's one reason to think they might view a disability differently than someone who is non-disabled, but thinking about what their life would be like if suddenly they became disabled. So even if somebody who has vision, who has the ability to hear, who's not disabled in any way, even if that person thinks having disabilities would take away from flourishing, they might not be in a good position to make that judgment. People who actually have disabilities that we're talking about are the ones we really need to be talking to to see does that feature or trait impact your life in a negative way, and if so, why? Is it inherent to the actual trait? Is it the trait itself that makes one's life harder or worse off? Or is it how society treats people with disability that makes their life harder or more difficult or more painful? On this subject, Barnes continues, people accustomed to their impairments may have little to report about what it feels like to have these impairments, in part because the absence of a function or a sense may not be something they experience as such until it is called to their attention. In other words, what Barnes is saying is that people who don't have the ability to hear, who have never had the ability to hear, won't recognize that as something they're lacking until other people make them feel that way, as though they're lacking something. Barnes's point is that from that person's perspective, this is just how life is. This is just normal. And Barnes really underscores this by saying, a person who can see but not hear has very different sensory experiences from a person who can hear but not see, who in turn has very different experiences from a person who can see and hear but cannot move his legs. One thing that she's pointing out here is that you have tons of variations in terms of how people are embodied. Some people can hear, some people can see, some people can't do either. But whatever the case, it's not true that everyone who's affected by a disability reports that their life is bad because of that disability. That is, it's not the case that everyone who has a disability thinks that their disability is a bad thing for them. To them, it might just be that their disability is normal, or they might perceive it as a positive thing. They might see it as part of their identity, part of who they are. Now, all this to say, it could very well be the case that many people who have disabilities experience negatives associated with those disabilities strictly because of how society treats them. What that would suggest is there's nothing about the disability itself that makes life harder or more painful or anything negative, but how people with disabilities have been treated, that's what actually diminishes well-being and flourishing. And that's something that can be addressed on a social level rather than with medical interventions. In a society where people with disabilities are discriminated against, for example, people with disabilities might experience their disability as a bad thing, but that might not happen in a society that didn't discriminate against people with disabilities. So even people who have disabilities who experience those disabilities as a negative thing, that might be because of how they're being treated rather than anything associated with the condition itself. This leads us directly to the second model of disability. So we talked about the medical model, that's where disability is viewed as a kind of physiological problem to be corrected with medical intervention. It's a pathological condition. The social model, on the other hand, goes something like this. According to the social model, disability is the disadvantage produced by social prejudice against certain types of persons, namely persons with impairments. Were society not organized in a way that penalizes people with impairments, there would be no disabled people. Disability just is the negative net effects 
of having an impairment in a society that discriminates against those with impairments. We can put the view like this. People are embodied in all different sorts of ways. Some people can hear, some people can't. Some people can see, some people can't. Some people are biologically male, some people aren't. And so there are all sorts of variations in the types of bodies that exist. According to the social model, if there's anything negative associated with being embodied in a disabled body, that negative is tied to how society treats or discriminates against people with those conditions. What that means then is there's nothing inherently negative about disability, and because of that, it might actually be more reasonable to refer to people as differently abled as opposed to disabled. The term disability might have some sort of connotation associated with a negative, it's a bad deviation from normal functioning, but difference, diff being differently abled, doesn't suggest anything negative or positive. It's just a different way of being. And our society is one in which treats people with certain differences differently. So people with a particular impairment, the inability to hear or the inability to see, they might be treated by our society in a really bad way, discriminated against, not given fair opportunities in the workplace. And those are negatives, but the negatives are based in how society treats them, not in terms of how they're embodied. So on the social model, there's nothing defective or bad or negative about having an impairment, a physiological feature that impedes your ability to have a certain sense or function in a certain way. There's nothing bad about those, but disability is what happens to a person who's discriminated against, who's put into a position where they don't have the same opportunities, they're treated unfairly simply because of the way their body is. In this case, then, it's society that's doing the disabling. It's not an impairment that's doing the disabling. So disability is not about the features of a person's body. Disability is about what society is doing to people with impairments. And impairments might not be a negative thing. People who have impairments versus people who don't, they might just be embodied differently. And so again, the term differently abled as opposed to disabled is sometimes used here. To sum up then, with respect to the medical model versus the social model. The medical model suggests that disabilities are inherently bad, they're something to be fixed, corrected, or cured. The social model suggests that impairments, like an inability to see, are not inherently bad, but people with those impairments are sometimes treated unfairly. So people with impairments are sometimes discriminated against or treated unfairly by social structures, not given the same opportunities, not given the same chance to flourish. And that's what is bad here. It's how society is treating people with impairment. It's not the impairment itself. Now, this is not to endorse either model. The medical model and social model are sometimes seen as two extremes on a spectrum. And so there's tons of options in between the two. Maybe disability is some combination of impairment plus how society treats individuals. So there are a lot of options here. But one thing to keep in mind, at least according to Wasserman and co-authors, is that the medical model is rarely defended but often adopted unreflectively by healthcare professionals, bioethicists, and philosophers who ignore or underestimate the contribution of social and other environmental factors to the limitations faced by people with disabilities. That is, people might assume the medical model is true without thinking much about it, not realizing that in many cases, a person with disabilities might not be able to flourish or secure their own well-being because of how society is set up. And if you overlook that, if you overlook the negative effect that society's structures have on people with disabilities, then you might have a skewed sense that disabilities are really bad. When in reality, if social structures were made to be more accommodating, more inclusive, more fair to people with disabilities, then many of those negatives might actually go away. So Wasserman and co-authors are just worried that people are assuming the medical model without thinking too much. Furthermore, when we compare the medical model and the social model, how we fix any sort of associated problem is it looks different. So with the medical model, it's the impairment itself, it's the, it's the state of the person's body itself that needs to be fixed, corrected, or cured. There's something wrong about their body or their way of being embodied that needs to be fixed, and so sometimes a medical intervention is used. With the social model, medical interventions don't appear to be necessary, at least not to the same degree. To fix the problem of people with disabilities not flourishing, 
What needs to change is how society operates, how it treats people with disabilities or impairments. So not only do these different groups of people think differently about disability, but as an extension of that, how they go about correcting or fixing the negatives associated with disability is going to look very different as well. The medical model is going to focus on the individual and the physiology of the individual. The social model is going to focus on restructuring society, making society a fair place for people with disabilities. Now, Wasserman and co-authors might actually be right. If you look back at Savulescu's essay, this idea of procreative beneficence was central to his essay. The idea being, you should make sure that your children don't have any traits that will detract from their well-being. And blindness and deafness were counted among those traits for Savulescu. So Savulescu just thinks that blindness and deafness take away from an individual's well-being. They're inherently bad. So Savulescu is really assuming something like the medical model without giving any defense of it and without looking at the testimony of people with disabilities either. Because of that, he sees blindness and deafness and those sorts of traits as an inherent negative to be fixed, cured, or in his case, eliminated from the population. Walter Owens, in the Baby Doe case, seemed to make the same sort of assumptions, that having Down syndrome is just an inherently negative thing. I should clarify, too, that it's not clear at all that Down syndrome should even count as a disability, as opposed to just being embodied differently. With this in mind, the idea that a lot of people might actually just be assuming a medical model or something like that without thinking too hard about it, here's what Kevin Timpe says. Cultural perceptions of the badness of disability permeate much of our media. Popular movies suggest that it's better to die than to live with a disability. Yet, disability is part of many people's lives. It's a part of their identity. Disability isn't something to be ashamed of or to hide. Disability doesn't mean people need to be pitied. It is not better to be dead than disabled. What Timpe is suggesting, then, is that our culture might have a common sort of preconception that disability is a bad thing, or that it takes away from one's well-being or ability to flourish or live a happy life, but that just isn't the experience that is had by many people with disabilities. And so that preconception of disability as a negative is something that we need to look at really critically. And one of the best ways to do this is to go and actually talk to and interview and speak with and learn from people who have disabilities. People might judge conditions like blindness to be a bad thing, something that they would never want to experience, but that might not be echoed by people who actually live with blindness. People who have disabilities might value those disabilities in radically different ways from people who are not disabled. So to sum up a little bit, we looked at the medical model, we looked at the social model. The medical model views disability as this negative feature associated with the individual's body or physiology that needs to be fixed with a medical intervention in, in many cases. The social model saw disability as the negatives associated with social structures. So people are embodied in all sorts of different ways. Some have impairments, some don't. But disability is when society groups those people with impairments together and makes their lives harder or makes their lives more painful or takes away from them the ability to flourish or to live happy lives. But that can be corrected with social interventions as opposed to medical interventions. As we try to adjudicate between these types of views then, it's going to be imperative that we look at the testimony of people who have disabilities to hear what they have to say about what is it that's positive or negative about their own experiences, what's positive or negative about their own lives, and how do they view their disability? Do they see it as a negative thing or do they see it as a reason that society treats them negatively as opposed to a negative thing itself? All of these will help us sort through whether the medical model or social model or some other option seems the most plausible. But because of this, because of the importance of actually listening to people who have disabilities, it's no mistake that a central slogan of the disability rights movement has been nothing about us without us. Or, as Elizabeth Barnes puts it, any discussion of or research into disability not informed by that experience, the experience of people with disabilities, would likely be inaccurate and misguided. That is, if only people who are quote-unquote able-bodied are the ones making judgments about the value or disvalue of disability, chances are they're going to get things wrong, according to Barnes at least. So when assessing the differences between the medical model and the social model, we need to look at the testimony of people with disabilities. We need to take that seriously. And if that calls the medical model into question, that needs to be taken seriously as well.
As a final thought, at several points in this video there were questions about whether life with a particular condition would be worse than death. That's going to be a question that we're going to continue to look at in the next two videos. In the next two videos we're looking at questions about euthanasia, and one of the issues that will come up is whether or not death can actually ever be beneficial to an individual. And in short, you might think that death can't benefit an individual because at the moment of death there's nobody left to be benefited. So it's not the case that somebody who dies is better off because there's just no them. There's nobody there to be benefited. So when we look at the cultural presupposition that Timpe was talking about, that our culture seems to think that death is preferable to living with certain conditions, that point is going to be challenged by some of what we look at in the next two videos, because it might be the case that death can never really benefit an individual. In the meantime, however, here are some references that I relied on for this talk. Definitely check them out if you're at all interested in learning more about various definitions of disability, ways that people have tried to conceptualize it, as well as questions about the medical model, the social model, and further alternatives.